you all taking the time this morning to uh, spend time around God's word. In these times, you remember the, um, as a child, perhaps you used to play, or perhaps with your grandchild, you played the game rock, paper, scissors, where one has to beat the other rock, scissors, and paper. Um, well, there's a new one being invented, and the current one is Zoom beats face mask. And I'm so grateful that Zoom does meet beat face mask. Um, it's a real blessing that we have opportunity to share God's word this morning. Tim's already given you the headlines that we're going to look at Solomon. Uh, the greater than Solomon is one part of that. Of course, if we're talking about Solomon, it's very easy to in introduce him, isn't he? David was his father. That puts him into the Old Testament quite permanently. And he wrote three of the books in the Old Testament. So we know him as a significant, significant contrib contributor, and he received that, those amazing gifts from a famous queen. But more importantly, uh, and more of interest to us today, he received the ultimate gift from God. So hopefully I'll be able to share my PowerPoint with you if all the technical aspects go well, uh, and we'll just start to... Uh, weave our way through the story of Solomon. And uh, there's the first technical difficulty. Right. Hopefully, that's screen sharing that for you. Is that all right, Tim? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. good. Great. So, obviously, we're talking about Solomon, so let's split it up. Now, you probably will be a little bit stunned by the first title there. I want to split our short time together, first of all, by considering Solomon and the Garden of Eden. And that's going to take some time to think through, isn't it? You're not expecting that one, are you? But bear with me. Solomon, at the great dream that he had, the glitzy visitor, and you, you've no doubt managed to work out what parts of the story those are. And then the greater than will be our finishing um, part of our message today. So it'll be great to just take you through that. You'll be able to tell where I'm up to uh, on that and how long dinner needs to be delayed for if I run on uh, this morning. So let's get into this. The Garden of Eden. What is John on about? For those that know me, I don't always think in straight lines. And here we go again. The Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 verses 8 and 9. It simply says that the Lord God planted a garden and in that garden was the tree of the knowledge and good and evil and you start to think oh Solomon good and evil wisdom that's what he was after it's all the way back in Genesis what a surprise move on Adam if there were titles begin being given Adam would have been king of the creation wouldn't he king of the garden and of course Solomon was king of God's people and of course, in the Garden of Eden, there was a matter of choices and they didn't make the right choice and sin came into all the world. Solomon had choices he had to make and we'll be looking at those later. I want to dig just a little bit deeper into this. So Solomon, is he another Adam? Solomon's prayer reversed a load of the failures uh, of Adam and Eve. Not all of them didn't replace sin. I'm not in any way going to be suggesting that but just in aspects of blessing. And he leads, this leads to a time of abundance for the people in the kingdom. And that's what, what God wanted to bless Adam and Eve with, a time of abundance. But of course, just as in Genesis and the Garden of Eden, failure came along. So too with Solomon's life, we see a failure come along as well. So you start to see a picture building and we want to learn wisdom from the successes and the failures in Solomon's life. So let's move on. The Garden of Eden, Solomon, what is the links? The first Adam, is he a new Adam? Is he another Adam? Just bear with me as we build this picture to widen the context of Solomon's life. God planted a garden, a Garden of Eden, and it says in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 10, verse 10 God's promise to David, I will plant my people. Very unusual wording. I will plant my people. So we could see possibly the links. 
in the Garden of Eden. They were the blessing was to be fruitful and multiply. You come to 1 Kings chapter 4, during the reign of Solomon, it says the people were as numerous as the sands by the sea. You can almost see those prophecies to Abraham being fulfilled. And here we are, uh, the promise of the Garden of Eden, the, the, uh, are now being seen out amongst the pe God's people. The Garden of Eden, if you follow it geographically, it's the place from which rivers flowed. So it was a nice high place. And of course, Solomon goes to Gibeon and Gibeon is the high place where sacrifices were offered. And there he meets God. So the Garden of Eden, where Adam met God, Gibeon, where God meets God, a high place. Just one more set of comparisons. Creation was good. We know that in many ways. It was very good in certain instances. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 10. It says there that God heard Solomon's prayer, Solomon's speech, and it was good. So we get a parallel of something good being in amongst all this again. Adam, he was put to sleep and God provided for him the things he couldn't do for himself in the creation of Eve. Go into our passage in 1 Kings chapter 3 and if you're following it, verse 15, it says there Solomon awoke and God provided for him the things he couldn't do for himself when he gave him wisdom. Go back into the Garden of Eden and this is the, the last of those um, I think it might be just a last few of the command, the issues. Garden of Eden, there was a command, wasn't there? Not to eat of the tree. And if you follow the story of Solomon, God gave him commands uh, over his life in, in verse 14. Our last set of comparisons, there was a tree in the middle of the garden, a daily reminder of the truth and the good and evil. Solomon was told to keep these commands daily to get the blessings of truth and evil. So you get that idea of a daily reminder in the garden and Solomon's command, commanded by God to continue to keep these commands to get the blessing of wisdom. I'm sure in the Garden of Eden there were times when Adam sat under a tree just wanting to relax under the uh, blessings that God had provided and in 1 Kings chapter 4 verse 25 it says that every man sat under his vine and his fig tree. They were no longer at war as they were when David was their leader. Blessings were being bestowed upon them and that's what we see uh, in our scene uh, there. Also there were Adam and Eve of course named the trees, the animals, the birds, the creeping things and the fish. And you'd say, yeah, well, that's almost a, a, a reference out of uh, Genesis. Well, that's a reference from 1 Kings 4, verse 3, because it says there that Solomon spoke of all these things. And I see the sun starting to get in the way of uh, the camera. So apologies for a movement there. Um, so there's how Solomon links to the Garden of Eden. I find it quite interesting that the themes from the Garden of Eden come out again in the in the life uh, of Solomon but there's a far more important thing for me because Ad Adam, Solomon and Jesus all come together. Jesus is described as the last Adam, you might have already been there, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living thing and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. I think it's great that there's a first Adam there's possibly another Adam in Jewish ways of thinking, as they would think of Solomon. We might not call him that by name, but they know of the blessings in his life and those parallels. But for me, it doesn't matter whether there's a first Adam and another Adam. My faith rests on the last Adam. And it brings great joy to our souls to know that there is that last Adam, the uh, author of our salvation. Let's go on. The great dream. We've got a Bible passage to follow here. Uh, and as we look at it, if you want to turn to it, it's 1 Kings chapter 3. And while you do that, I'm going to move even more around the corner uh, to avoid the sun that keeps chasing me. So my apologies for geographically keep relocating my pulpit. Hey, the pleasures of Zoom. So 1 Kings chapter 3, as we look at it verse by verse, I'll make a few comments and then we'll move on. So if you're ready, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, it says there, and, Sol 
At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? Gibeon, let's start there. Place of worship, if you're um, an Old Testament expert, 2 Chronicles 1 verse 3 would tell you that's where the tabernacle had been. And Solomon goes to Gibeon uh, there. And if you look in verse 4, you find of our passage in 1 Kings 3, you find that they've offered a thousand sacrifices. It's been a busy day when they arrive at Gibeon. So they're wanting to draw near to God. They're wanting God's presence amongst them. That's what Solomon desires. Uh, and it simply reminds us of that verse in James, doesn't it? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the pleasures we can gain from being in the presence of God and sharing with God's people. Move on in our story, though, and there was a dream. Amazing. God speaking to an individual. It's, it's an unusual dream, a unique dream, because you could think of, well, Jacob, he had a ladder and angels. And yet God spoke to Solomon. God spoke to the very man, not using an angel, not using something through which he would speak. He spoke personally, uh, a very unique account in the Bible of this dream that God is wanting to engage individually. And I just think it's great that God intervenes in individually with each one of us in all our different needs, in all our different ways. And you see the time of day that he did it? He did it at night. What was that all about? Well, obviously they've had, it's taken a while to do a thousand sacrifices. Um, even you or I would take a fair while to do a thousand of anything, never mind a thousand sacrifices. And um, maybe that was just the time that Solomon got to be on his own. Maybe it was that quality time. And isn't it good to know that even in the busyness of trying to bring about worship and serving God, there are then times when God wants to intervene in our life and bless us through his word and, and bless us through fellowship. And so just great that Solomon is having fellowship with God in the quietness of this eve, that evening that was uh, before them but equally the final part of verse five is the question gets asked doesn't it god the all-powerful god the god of all creation has to ask a question what's that all about simply he asks ask what shall i give you and on one level of course we know god knew what he wanted to give but he wanted solomon to engage in it it's great that god wants us to engage in his work god is wanting to open his checkbook the bountiful resources of heaven, the unlimited resources, and want Solomon to be engaged uh, in that process. What are our needs? Obviously, for sins to be given, obviously. And then there goes on, doesn't it, for God to bless us, to bless our families. But then there's those personal needs that are behind a mask. God will meet our every need, and he is the author of all things. And it's just great that we can rely on him. Uh, that God is there waiting to hear our plea. Yes, he might already know what but God wants us to hear our voice or for us to, as his child to engage with him uh, and go on that journey. The rest of our story, just three headings for it, spontaneous response, singular response and a sincere response. So we'll just look at those headings uh, as we briefly look through our passage. So, um, We'll stay with that. So if you look at verse 6, verse 6 is Solomon uh, answering, you have shown great mercy to your servant, uh, David, my father. And he goes through and he gives a, a, a biography of da uh, David. And he comes to the end of uh, this. It's not that Solomon needed to do, it's not a, um, mil um, he wants to be a millionaire question, is it? He doesn't say you can Ask the audience, you can phone a friend. Solomon's straight in there, uh, giving his answer to God, a spontaneous response. And he goes through the biography of David. And it's encouraging when there's a biography of people uh, that's gone before, isn't it? And we ultimately want to seek to be that, get that biography that said, good and faithful servant. Verse 7, O oh Lord my God, is what Samuel, Solomon says. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, and I am but a little child and do not know how to go out or come in. An amazing verse for a king to say. He wouldn't say it before his peers. 
He wouldn't say it before the children of Israel, but before God, he could pour out his heart. Oh, Lord, my God, the relationship aspect, your servant, his position before him, and him wanting to be obedient and seeking to do the will of God, coming as a child. And if the story was unknown to us, we think we would know the answer when he asked that question. I do not know how to go out or come in. What does he want? A sat now. No, 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 no. Of course, there's a lot more to this story. Uh, and if we didn't know any more, it, it would have been an interesting one. Because here we have a man asking for directions. How unique is that in the history of men? A rarity, uh, certainly in our household, I have to say. But let's go on. Verse, verses 8 and 9, you get that singular response. Just cast your eye down to verses 8 and 9. Your servant is in the midst of your people who you have given, you have chosen a great people, too numerous to be numbered, too numerous to be counted. Therefore, give your servant an understanding heart. If you follow the Greek, the Hebrew word in understanding is Shema. So you're getting into that, what with the, the Shema, the Jewish uh, statement of a Jewish prayer. Uh, to hear is its meaning, to listen and to obey it's far more than just understanding you know i think as a going through sunday school i thought solomon just got an instant download of wisdom all the best books on wisdom were just whoosh straight into solomon's brain that's not the way it was god wanted him to understand shema to listen to hear and to obey an ongoing relationship of wisdom is what God was providing Solomon. While ever there was that communion between the two of them, God, God would provide Solomon the ability, if he would hear, if he would listen, if he would obey. So far more in that uh, than just simply uh, an instant download. Verse 10, it says he pleased God. Look at that verse, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon uh, asked these things and that's just absolutely great and it's great that we can do some things that please God um, and it's useful in our lives to just ponder that isn't it what is it that we do that pleases God verses 11 through 14 are simply telling us what God knew that Solomon hadn't asked for the things he could have asked for his enemies to die no that wasn't appropriate for this king uh, for further knowledge now we have the ultimate understanding. And I think it's great that from God come ultimate things like my salvation. It's the ultimate salvation. I don't have to do anything to get any more of it. I am saved. And it's brilliant that we can rest secure on those promises of God. But let's move on. Let's get into the glitzy visitor. Uh, and she's in 1 Kings chapter 10. And if you uh, know the story, of course, we're going to look at the Queen of Sheba, uh, verses 1 to 10 and verse 27 are, are where we'll be casting our eye. Just look down at, at what 1 Kings chapter 10 says um, as we look at it. Now the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to test him with many hard questions. Simple words. It's a 1200 mile journey for her. And there's no cars, there's no motorways, this is camels, donkeys, whatever you would like to travel in, um, in the day. It's 1200 miles to come and ask questions of Solomon. That was how much far, how far she wanted to go to test God's representative of his wisdom in this earth. I don't know about you, don't know what your experiences have been, but for us as a church, we've seen people come in many, many miles to before lockdown to gather with us. They'd seen us online. Uh, they'd asked many questions. And because when church opened uh, in July, we were one of the first to start our services, get services going, socially distanced, of course. And people came that we'd never seen before that had loads of questions. There were the skeptics, but there were people there as well that said, I've heard about it and I want to share in this. There were people that had said, I gave this up years ago, but I want more of it now. Uh, and we rejoice in the things that God does. She obviously brought her hard questions and we think of the scribes that asked many an hard question of Jesus and people like Josh McDowell that tried to disprove the resurrection and were led to faith through that study 
uh, of God's word. Look at verse 2. She says there that she, she came to Jerusalem with a very great company with camels and with spices, much gold and precious stones. Uh, and when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was on her heart. Wow. So to God's representative on this earth, she spoke what was on her heart. And many people do that, don't they? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the opportunity to speak what's on your heart for the desires of your heart to be overcome. Nothing is too difficult is what verse 3 shows, it shows us. So Solomon answered all her questions and there was nothing too difficult for the king. If there's nothing too difficult for Solomon, there's nothing too difficult for our God. Uh, God is not limited by man's ways and their past finding out. You know, we look at the, what she sees and she sees that there's been many and many blessings. As your eyes go down, she looks at his servants and sees that they're blessed. She sees the house that he's built. And wow, that's amazing. You don't have to blow, go verse by verse, but you can just cast your eye down those things. And as a church, we've had people that would um, have been made redundant during this um, pandemic. And you'd think, oh, no, first generation Christian made redundant. This is going to be such a test of faith. They've held on to their God. And what's happened? They've got better jobs, better jobs than they had before. How does that work? There's a pandemic on. God blesses his people where he has opportunity and where they are faithful to him. And we rejoice in having a God that blesses us in those ways. Look at verse 7 and we see there, Moreover, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. This is the Queen of Sheba speaking. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame for which I heard. She saw with her own eyes. Remember Thomas? He wanted to see the Lord and it was only when he'd seen the nail prints in his hand and the spear mark in his side that he believed. And here we have it for the Queen of Sheba, she saw with her eyes. Verses 8 and 9, she no longer is praising Solomon, she's praising Solomon's God. Um, verse 9, blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, seeing you on the throne of Israel. You get the idea of a changed life, don't you? God did a miracle. Uh, and it's no longer Solomon she's fixed on. She's fixed on to God. Um, and if you follow the story and you believe what some of the commentators would say, that she takes the great news that Solomon, what Solomon, uh, Solomon's words and God's word back to her people. And then years and years later, uh, in the book of Acts, there's an Ethiopian eunuch. And some would make that connection that maybe he was from. Uh, the stories that she told about Solomon. And that's for you to consider and ponder. I'm not making that a, a doctrinal point, but it's interesting that there could be that connection. We at church have, uh, and at work have seen those blessings that come through being faithful to God's word. Um, many, many visitors we at work have put our Bible studies online. Um, and when, if we'd done them in the building, there would be room for 20 visitors. We've had 70 plus visitors. We've had international visitors. God is doing an amazing work despite the things of this world seemingly getting in the way and stopping us. Our conference that they'd normally be 200 people at, well, we condensed it from three days to one and thought, well, it'll be, we'll be a struggle to get 200. We got 775 people at our conference. God is good and using uh, many different ways to continue to bless his people and to reach out to more. So it's actually very interesting that the glitzy visitor got the message because of Solomon's life and Solomon's blessings when everything was good. We'll see it might change later on, but hey, everything is good at this point. Our final section, greater than. Matthew chapter 12 in verse 30, 42, the queen of the south, what does she do? Uh, she's there saying that this generation will rise up in judgment uh, from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of what Solomon, because there's a greater than Solomon is here. Wow. These are the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus are greater than Solomon is here. 
the Queen of the South would rise up in judgment on this generation because there's a greater than Solomon. We need to look into why Jesus could say that. What is this? Well, who is Jesus pointing to? Of course, he's talking about himself. So let's do that comparison. Um, Solomon, his name, it means peace, and he brought peace. You look at it in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. It's clear there was peace in that, that time. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and under his fig tree. Peace. Jesus is far greater. Think of the peace of Jesus. Prince of Peace, that title that was given of him. His life on a boat, still in the storm. The demon possessed man, give him peace. That future day when there'll be in a heavenly peace. But what about in our lives? There's something that distinguishes us, isn't there? That we have peace when all around is caught up in the storms of vaccine, in the storms of virus and the storm of everything else that goes on. And yet Christians just go along in peace with God. And that's, we don't always realise we have that peace, but the world does. The world sees it and we rejoice that Jesus is greater than Solomon. Solomon, okay, he was just David's son. Not bad, not a bad heritage, that one. Um, and yet that Jesus is greater than he's God's son. God's son. And he was prophesied, wasn't he? And lived amongst men. One day will return. What a son God has. What a son God had. And what a son God has with us now, the I am. God appeared in a dream to Solomon. It's not dreams when you come to Jesus. He was with God in heaven and he left it to save us. And God spoke about his son when he was in this earthly scene. You remember the words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So we know he was far greater than Solomon in as much that God didn't just speak to one person. He spoke to many a person in that crowd that were listening in on those days when heavens were opened. Let's look on at some other aspects. So Solomon, he asked for God's wisdom. Jesus, greater than, never had to ask for God's wisdom, but just the Luke chapter two and verse 40. At the age of 12, what does it say when he's there in the synagogue? Mary and Joseph have lost him. Jesus is there with the rabbis and it says he was filled with wisdom filled with wisdom greater than Solomon Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 24 says he has many visitors and great it's great to have visitors isn't it we're all missing visitors and Christmas is going to be the time for visitors just think of the many a crowd that gather to listen to Jesus far greater just think of many a generation that's listened to Jesus far greater and just think of the many in that future day that will worship Jesus in his presence in that heavenly place. Let's go on. Solomon, he made silver of low value. It says in, in 1 Kings 10 and verse 27, just think of heaven. When we are taken into the place that Jesus has said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. What's he doing? Well, for one thing, he's laying the streets with gold because it tells us that in Revelation. Jesus is preparing a place for us that has streaks of gold. So you can see far greater than Solomon. Let's roll on. Solomon, he gave wisdom to the people. Proverbs 4 verse 7 is perhaps a classic. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Jesus, far greater. He gave his life for the world. And in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. And these things will be added unto you, given to you. Wow, far greater than Solomon. And of course, you know the story of Solomon. His love for God grew cold. 1 Kings 11 verse 1. And then he didn't walk the talk. There's a distance between him and God. And we'll, we're going to see that in just a few minutes in just a bit more detail. But by comparison, Jesus, the greater than Solomon, what does it say? He did all that their father required of him, far greater than Solomon. There's a verse in Deuteronomy, and uh, in Deuteronomy 17, verses 16 and 17, it's a passage there for the kings when they were uh, brought into 
position that they had to write out the Old Testament laws. And it says, the king shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he be greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And you're already going ahead of me, aren't you there? He acquired many horses, did Solomon. There's many a stable that you can go to in the ruins uh, of the land that shows where the horses that Solomon went and got from Egypt. Think of Jesus, far greater than he rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey, borrowed donkey's colt. Wow, no donkey, no horses of his own. Rode in as king, people were shouting hallelujah. Uh, to the Messiah, and yet he rode on a borrowed donkey. The second of those uh, commands from Deuteronomy, Solomon accumulated many wives, and these were as possessions for the peace treaties uh, that he was establishing. He's going away from the things of God now, and yet when we look at Jesus far greater, you see Jesus and the life of Jesus, women in position of prominence, Mary, Women at the grave, you can think of the stories the, uh, that show that Jesus was not treating women in anywhere near the same way that Solomon was. Far greater is Jesus. And of course, the last one, he amassed gold and silver. Um, the command was don't, Solomon did. Think of Jesus. To get a coin to illustrate his parable, he had to take a, fit, a, a coin out of a fish's mouth. Wow, far greater than Solomon. And you know, as we ponder all those things, isn't it great that Jesus said those words? It wasn't somebody else that made the connection and said, we think Jesus. Jesus, God's son, said, I am greater than Solomon. We don't have to look back for a man of any standing in history. We can look back to God's son who was provided for the world, for the sins of the world. So let's sum up our passage and some of our time together, the Garden of Eden, it reversed some of the failures. Uh, Solomon reversed some of the failures from the Garden of Eden to bring about great blessings. Are we dwelling in God's blessings today? There's a challenge for us there, isn't there? Uh, and just as the Garden of Eden had its failures, so too we need, we need to address our failures before God, don't we? The great dream, God wants to commune with us. Solomon went and did worship and God spoke to him. Let's bring our hearts of worship before him and let his words speak into our lives. The glitzy visitor, who will we witness to today? Who will we have opportunity to share God's word to? It was simply Solomon's life that she saw and it took her to God. People around us, maybe that's all they see, our lives. But does it take them to God? Ultimately, that would be our desire, wouldn't it? And the greater than, let's, we've got something to rejoice in here. Greater than Solomon is Jesus. And I, the question is, is Jesus greater than us? Do we point people to Jesus? Or do people see how brave we are, how commanding, how authoritative, we're in control? Or do we say, well, God has blessed me. I trust God for do we point Jesus, people to Jesus in our lives? That's what Jesus was simply saying, wasn't it? Don't look at Solomon, look at me. And my desire would be that people would not look at me, but would look at Jesus. And they see me, may they see things that say, hey, why is your life different? Who is it that makes your life different? There's a, a modern worship song and it simply says, has, has in it a chorus that says, I will look back and see you are faithful. And that's what we've done today. We've looked back and seen that God has been faithful with Solomon. And the next part of that song says, I will look ahead, believing you are able. And my desire today is that would be our desire, that we would say, if God was the God of Solomon, I will trust him for what's before me and what's ahead of me. If God could achieve this through Solomon, 
wants him to achieve it through me. And may it be a blessing that we spent time linking Solomon to the Garden of Eden, where you'd probably never have thought of been going when we started our time together. It's nothing wrong with being the occasional gardener uh, when you go into the Garden of Eden and you see God at work in two lives and then seeing how that comes on as a blessing. So thank you for sharing, giving me an opportunity to share this time this morning. I'll hand back to Tim, or is it to Keith, to close in prayer. Um, but thank you once again. And I trust